Becky. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Okay, I'm even wearing a, a, a dress shirt today just to prove to people. As, as my I'm, stepmother told me to do as well. I'm not wearing my pajamas. Yeah. Uh, although. Although you could be. I could be. Yeah. That's right. You don't know. Yeah. Uh, anyway, um, I guess the first topic up is uh, this big, allegedly big New York Times story about uh, the classified NSA spying on Americans. You've written a lot about it. Yeah. Uh, my take is, my instinct is that there's less to this than seems, than the New York Times thinks there is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, no, yeah, um... You might be right. I mean, I was, um, as, I, as I mentioned on my blog, um, I, I was uh, talking to a, um, a law professor, a liberal law professor, who specializes in national security law, who, who actually pointed out that um, this is not obviously unconstitutional. Um, and it's something that, you know, I was watching the Sunday news programs. Everybody, I, I think, seems to kind of be getting that wrong. doesn't mean it is necessarily unconstitutional, but that it's a, a very obviously sort of Undecided area, undeclared area. So. Well, I, I, the key, the first key thing seems to me that they're not targeting communications between Americans. So if I phone you, the NSA isn't intercepting that. It's only if it has some, you know, it's a communication between the United States and abroad, right. which seems to me already puts it in sort of a murky gray area, and uh, and also dramatically limits the scope. So it's not like the activities in Vietnam where the the uh, Defense Department was not only monitoring but disrupting any war activities. Uh, it's a far cry from that. Yeah, I mean, you know, they're not looking around, what is it, Daniel Ellsberg's, you know, his shrinks files or whatever. Um, but uh, but that doesn't mean, I, I mean, yeah, I, I suspect that it was probably limited. It was sort of very murky. But the, the real question is, why did they need to do that? And, and there might be a good answer to this, by the way. But why did they need to do it as opposed to going through, you know, FISA, the National Security Court? Do, do you know the answer well, to that? And actually, Bobby Inman, that's the great mystery. And, and Bobby Inman, who was the head of the NSA, uh, was quoted with a very reasonable quote saying, uh, look, before, before they had the Patriot Act, when the standard of proof was high, you could see where they'd want to get around the court. But now, why do they have to do it? I tend to think the answer is probably if you find Abu Zubaydah's phone book, yeah. you want to tap those people immediately before news gets out that we have Abu Zubaydah's phone book. The four hours that it takes to get this special court to approve uh, these hundreds or thousands of wiretaps, uh, you know, might be all the difference. Yeah, except for, except for, I mean, there are two things, right? One is that, in my understanding, and I'm no FISA expert, but from the from uh, basically the cherry picked stuff that I've read is that you can actually get a FISA um, warrant post facto, right? You can go and you can say we need to get these numbers from Abu Zubaydah's. Uh, we need to tap those numbers from his phone book, and then you go to the court the next morning or whenever is appropriate in some you know limited amount of time, and then right. you get it. I actually, but I actually did hear another legitimate explanation for it from the same sort of law professor I, I spoke yeah. with, and, and that is that um, you hear a lot about, well, FISA is kind of this rubber stamp court, right? They never turn anything down anyway, so it's a big mystery. His explanation is that there's an office within the um, FBI, and I don't remember the name of it, but that, that vets um, essentially applications for FISA warrants before they're sent to the FISA court. And right. that unlike the FISA court, it actually is pretty rough and turns a fair amount down. So, well, I think they got... Um they, they got a lot of grief from the FISA court in the Musawi case, didn't they? They were, they were very paranoid about going to it. Well, I think that's the thing, is that they were par there was a sort of bureaucratic inertia about it, right? They were afraid to do it. It doesn't mean they were going to get turned down. But, yeah, there was this sort of bureaucratic, whatever it was, timidity. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so it, it's possible that they, you know, said, look, there's just too much kind of, you call it red tape, whatever you want. Um, and so... They just said, screw it, you know, and we don't need to go through all this stuff up. It's, it's also possible that the administration is trying to make a point about executive power, and they don't want to even concede the principle that they should try to get this war. Yeah, except that they kept it secret from, you know, 2002 until now. So it's not, I don't know what kind of point you're Well, they briefed the members of Congress. There's, right. That's the, sec the second element of hypocrisy. The first element is 
It's not Big Brother assume we got Americans talking to Americans. The second element is that a lot of members of Congress knew about it. Well, I don't know about a lot of members of Congress. I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if you saw it was in today's, I, I think, Washington Post, where um, Bob Graham said, yeah. well, I, I was at the meeting where they say they talked about it, and you know, I don't remember them saying that they were spying on Americans. I just thought that they were going through, he basically said, like, going through American um, uh, kind of telephone links. Essentially, it was American wires, but it was foreign citizens. Right, and it was foreign abroad. And basically, some not of administration official called him a liar and said, you know, he's misremembering the briefing. Uh, huh. I, I have no idea what went on there, but since, he seems since questionable. Bob, since Bob Graham remembers every piece of toast he's ever written, <laughs> ever eaten, I'm just saying uh, it, it's murky think... how much how much Congress was told about it. Maybe they were. I have no idea. Yeah. Well, one thing I wonder about is: the, is there a connection to this program Echelon in Europe? Uh, Echelon was a program whereby we basically ran every, as I understand it, every fax, email, and phone conversation on the entire continent through these big computers to try to, like, like search for key words right. like, you know, right. bomb and terrorist and Osama, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering if, I've always wondered why they didn't apply this technology, if it works, to the United States. Well, because it's unconstitutional, right? Right. But, yeah. uh... Well, or it might be a gray area. I'm wondering if this might be the first inroad. In other words, you get Abu Zubaydah's phone book, right? There, there are a hundred names in it. Right. You probably don't have a hundred agents to monitor them around the clock, so they probably are using the same computers, right? Nah, you got me. I mean, I don't know. I mean, the, the question is, the, the numbers that they were talking about were, you know, in the New York Times, this sort of vague reference to it. What a few hundred people they set up to up to, right? Five hundred people at a time. Right. At a time. Right. So uh, I, got, I got no idea how you monitor it. Uh, by the way, what do you think about the, the New York Times' take on this? That they sat on it for a year, right? And then they decided that this is, you know, of such national interest um, that we have to publish it and, and the national security things are, you know, are, are not overriding concerns. Well, the left is going crazy about that because they think it might have helped uh, carry with an election if it had come out Right, but earlier. then there's the, there's the right version of it, which is, you know, this... Uh, that it was all about a book that was coming up, basically. That they right, and, and uh, I, I, I doubt that the New York Times held anything back in order to help Bush beat Kerry. So I would think that the book, uh, the book would be more important. But I, you know, people have legitimate con security concerns. I, you know, sincerity is always the least suspected motive. Right. In these things, and I, you know, Keller's a pretty straight guy. I would tend to think that that they were actually just worried about it, uh, but. Um, it is sort of the direct anal analogy to the Pentagon Papers case where they, they didn't heed the administration's concerns, uh, and here they did. Uh, the Times is also it's, it's, it's incredibly self-important about this. There's an amazing paragraph, which I'm now going to read from David Sanger's story, yeah. where he not only took credit for this revelation uh, producing the vote against the Patriot Act in the Senate, he took credit for, for something much more. He took credit basically... Uh, for uh, the New York Times' story prompting a drawdown of troops in Iraq. It says, But on Friday, as the debate in Washington swirled over the President's order to the NSA, General George W. Casey, the top American commander in Iraq, hinted that further reductions may be on the way. Those, that's further reductions in troops. Right. Uh, you know, this is... Um, an incredible abuse of the comes at a time conceit. Right, you know? right. Well, it's a, but, it, but if that's not that, that's that's trying to link one another. I don't know that it's the time trying to claim credit for it. I mean, it's well, sure. Well, but, but the NSA kind of had nothing to do with what General Casey said. Right, but but that just means that he's taking some sort of you know view of I don't know what what would the logic be. Essentially, he, he's trying to sort of celebrate all these things coming together, but he, is he really saying the New York Times is the sort of agent behind it I, I think implicitly, I mean, I could write, you know, uh, you know, on a Friday after I blogged about this item, General Casey reduced the troops, and then I, you know, I, why would I write that except to take bogus credit for having General Casey well, reducing the troops? Or, or, you know, look, it's been a, 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 a week, what would the connection be? Uh, I, you know what? I don't really see much of a logical connection. Uh, uh, well, we've reached agreement. That's that's the goal of this. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, maybe I'll ring the bell and we'll move on to topic two. Ring it. Uh, topic two is uh, the Iraq elections. There was sort of a a first wave of a predictable wave of well, these elections don't mean all that much. The Robert Wright 
version of it. The Robert Wright version, there was a piece by Fred Kaplan and Slate. Yeah, and uh, the Robin Wright, who's a really annoying, called like three people who predictably said, well, we have a long way to go. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then um, now there's sort of a, a third wave of, of people in, uh, like uh, Bill Crystal at the Weekly Standard and Lawrence Kaplan of the New Republic also, saying, well, maybe we have turned a corner. Yeah, but if you, if you actually look at, I mean, you know, what, what that, that uh, Weekly Standard piece was, is it was sort of culling together quotes actually from, from mostly from John Burns, from Dexter Filkins, right from the, the Washington Post, the New York Times mainly, I think, that was that day basically, you know, Iraqi saying, I'm kind of psyched, right? So I, I yeah, there was a clip job. Way. It was not very persuasive, I agree. The, the Kaplan piece in the New Republic was more persuasive. And Kaplan is a, if Lawrence Kaplan says we're turning the corner, that's grave grounds for worry that we're not turning a corner yeah. since a few months ago he had thrown in the towel and said, oh, Iraq is hopeless, Do, uh, chances for democracy seem yeah, doomed, blah, 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 blah. Of Andrew Sullivan-esque sort of bouncing back and forth? Yeah, not quite as bad, but he's, he, he, he's definitely gone, gone, he has mood swings. Yeah. And he's generally unreliable. I mean, he, he, you know, he's a, he also tried to bully bully critics of neocons as anti semites. So I I have an axe to grind against him. Yeah. But he did make the he did make uh, at least one good point, which is he he described the at least the mechanism. You know, the ba the main problem and the main problem with Crystal's editorial is the fact that Sunnis voted isn't necessarily a good thing because they voted to try to assert their power, and there's no indication that they don't get their power through political means, that, that they won't continue to pursue it. Right, it's not mutually it. exclusive. Just because you vote doesn't mean you're not going to pick up guns later that afternoon. Right, and General Casey has said this. Right, yeah. Uh, so you want, how are they going to be inveigled into, into participating in democracy and putting down the gun? Uh, Kaplan thinks that, well, leaders will crop up through the electoral process who will then be invested in the electoral process. I guess that's the, that's the hopeful view. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's a possibility. The, the other thing is, I, I actually have to say, I, I, was, uh, I was sympathetic to this sort of, becoming very sympathetic to this sort of Peter Galbraith view of, there is no Iraq anymore, there is no Iraqi army. You might as well recognize the reality of, uh, you know, a Kurdish north, uh, a Shiite south, and a Sunni and sort of screwed Baghdad, basically. Um, and... I don't know. You, you actually didn't you see some quotes there giving you a little bit of hope that it was not necessarily a sort of deterministically sectarian as that. Maybe I'm maybe I'm being foolishly optimistic. No, I think that's right, and I think we'll see uh, we'll see how the vote goes. The, the the trouble is that the votes of the the secular non sectarian Iraqis may go to Alawi. Yeah, and I'm very troubled by that because. Uh, he seems, A, he seems corrupt, and B, there are two kinds of corruption. There's the corrupt guy who nevertheless delivers the services and skims off the top, and the corrupt guy who's so corrupt that the services never even get delivered. And he seems sort of the second form of corruption. Yeah. People were not impressed with his first tenure as prime minister. Yeah, and, and yet he's the, he's the sort of, you know, bright, shining hope of... Uh, well, that, that's the trouble. Yeah. And, and, and the, his strongest critics, of course, are the neocons, uh, the, the, the pro chalabi people are constantly saying that Alawi is a thug and corrupt. Uh, presume they, they claim that Chalabi is less of a thug and less corrupt. There, there was but actually a, uh, did, I don't know if you saw, but there was initially a, some sort of, kind of, I think, um, not very scientific exit poll that was done by Reuters that was talking about a high, uh, that, that, uh, that Alawi got a good percentage um, I, I saw that 38% in some areas of Baghdad. Yeah, right? So, you know, maybe that's one of the things that sort of made me think, geez, I don't know, maybe people are sort of crossing the sectarian lines a bit. Um, but there was a, there was a story in, uh, I think it's today's LA Times, somewhere sort of buried inside. It was talking about how uh, Alawi, um, no one's talking about totals yet, really, but that Alawi's already complaining about uh, voter fraud. Um, and uh, because he's, he, he apparently got, in his estimation, some very poor percentage um, yeah. of the vote overall. Uh, well, they're all complaining and they're all boasting about how high their totals yeah. are so they can complain when the totals come in lower. Yeah, I mean, it's jockeying. But I, I, I would suspect that if, if Alawi's complaining about that a whole lot, I don't know. I mean, it might be complicated. <coughs> yeah, that could be. He, I mean, he, I wouldn't put it, I mean, I, I hope he succeeds, but I wouldn't put anything past this guy. I mean, he's, he, 
I, he, he claimed they tried to assassinate him. Do we believe that, or do we think... No, it was just know, a, that thing that happened a couple of weeks ago in the sort of yeah. Shiite stuff. I don't think they... I, I, I mean, I don't know. I didn't read so much about it, but I got the sense that it was less trying to assassinate him than, you know... Uh, there was something sort of murkier about it. It seemed like there were some people who were really pissed off. Maybe it was some sort of kabuki theater thing. Not yeah, I, I thought maybe he sort of wanted to be attacked yeah. somehow. Yeah, I don't know what happened. Uh, it's, it, why would he go into the... I don't know. It, 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 anyway, uh, questions remain. The the other point that is... That one trouble spot is allowed. The other point that Amir Tahiri uh, made, which I thought was very good, is that none of the parties running are committed to the kind of market economy that's going to get the Iraqi economy back on its feet anytime soon. Yeah. Now, maybe you can't expect to transition from a you know, command economy to a market economy instantly. Yeah, maybe. I mean, yeah, but, yeah. but it is you know, one thing that would, would uh, encourage uh, you know, peace and discourage the insurgency is if, if things were booming. And, uh, and, and they're, they're sort of, there's, none of the parties are, is, is sort of backing the sort of economic policies that have reliably produced booming economies elsewhere. Yeah, but or I, unreliably produced them. I mean, wh I mean, what is it? What are you going to do? Like some sort of shock therapy at this point? And no, but it, it just you want somebody to who thinks. I mean, you, you know, energy is free, and you know, everybody gets these ration cards. They get they're used to getting their food rationed. You have to sort of be committed to gradually moving away from those things. I think. Yeah. Uh, if you want to bring energy un consumption under control, you can't have it be free. You know, this is a. Uh, I actually read that um, the guy who's uh, basically the, the leading candidate for Skiri Mahdi, um, right, um, is you know apart from being uh, on the on the sort of conservative side um, <laughs> in terms of uh, sort of mosque state opinions. Is apparently somewhat of a free marketer. Oh, really? Yeah, that, this would be LA Times mission today, and apparently would be the guy who would who would therefore be uh, most amenable in order in, to the U.S. Basically. So, um, interesting. Well, um, ring the bell. But, but, ring the bell. But the, I have one more point, which is there's actually not much debate on this. I mean, what what strikes me in all this is everybody thinks we're we're pulling out slow. You know, eventually, everybody thinks. Uh, at some point, our true presence becomes more of a hindrance than a help. Right. Uh, it, it, there's sort of not... The, the, the parameters of debate are, are narrow. The, the emotions are very broad. But the, in terms of actually what should happen, and everybody agrees what should happen. They, they, the Iraqis should get their act together and reach some sort of deal that yeah. Yeah, keeps the Sunnis happy and stops the civil war. I mean, I, yeah, except that... I, except, well... To some degree, we're sort of constrained by the possibilities, right? We're constrained by the reality. Right. But, but, but I also think that there, I mean, it, it's not a very kind of wide, wide differences, but I think that the differences are, are actually significant. I mean, you know, creating a sort of timeline, a sort of Mirtha as we basically pull out in six months type thing, you know, versus, uh, hey, we actually keep troops around and, and, you know, until you have this sort of, um, you know, sort of target based pullouts or whatever. You have the much murkier, basically, we stay as long as we need to stay in reality type situation. Uh, there's, that's, there's just substantial differences. I mean, We're right, but no, Bertha is a substantial difference, but he doesn't have much support except from Nancy Pelosi. No, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I mean yeah. Uh, but, I mean, he, has nothing, he doesn't have much official support. There's a vast, you know, movement within the Democratic Party that supports him. Right, but, uh, but, uh, but, uh, but, but those, are the, those are now the outlines of the of the overall debate. I agree with you, you know, Biden is not worlds away as much as he fetches every Sunday, you know, morning. It's not worlds away from Bush. I mean, right? even Mirtha is worlds away from Seymour Hersh, who said, here's a withdrawal plan. We all get up by midnight tonight. <laughs> That's what he said. Really? Okay, nobody's advocating, nobody except him is advocating that. Uh, well, that know, would be he's a, not that Mr. Would be Nuance, so. Sorry? He's not Mr. Nuance. No, yeah. no, especially when he talks on college campuses. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ring the bell now. Yeah. Oh, wait, can I make an addendum? I don't know if you can unring a bell, but one quick addendum. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, there was actually a report in um, the yesterday's Washington Post that, that says, and this is sort of hasn't gotten really any other kind of uh, follow-up at all, that the U.S. has actually pulled out two-thirds or is in the process of pulling out two-thirds of its sort of combat power from uh, the Sunni Triangle. So in other and, words, and its place goes what? What's that? 
In its place goes what? And, and its place presumably goes, uh, you know, those highly capable Iraqi forces. Well, I thought I thought there was there was um, there was an air of the Fallujah Brigade uh, behind you know around our actions in the Sunni Triangle. We're basically saying to Sunni chieftains, uh, you should join the armed forces yeah. so you can enforce the peace and we can leave. That's actually how they did that uh, uh, to some degree on election day too, in in, in some towns. And there well, was that's sort that's sort of alarming because when we tried that in Fallujah, the the Sunni forces that we'd recruited immediately went over to the insurgents. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I think, I mean, you know, look, there's, I think there's a lot of risk to it. it doesn't mean it's not the least bad option, though. Uh, I guess that's right. And the military people seem acutely sensitive of all these things. Yeah. It's not like it's not like that they're they're living in a cocoon and are unaware uh, that that you know their their presence may have good and bad aspects. Right. All right, um, ring the bell again. Okay, I'm ringing it again. Uh, the torture debate. Yeah. It seemed to me there was a big element of kabuki in it, which is, uh, this often happens in Washington. Uh, they reach compromise in, they reach a compromise in which McClay, McCain gets to proclaim victory. We have a flat ban against, uh, cruel and humane and degrading treatment. Right. But in, in the fine print, they create all these loopholes that let the administration get away with what it wants. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is that what's happened? You know more about it than I do. Uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I think that there's a degree to which um, I think I think McCain probably did introduce you know more constraints, it's simply insofar as it introduced at least more ambiguity, which is in a weird way a good thing in terms of you know if you're a CIA interrogator and you're about to engage in um, you know waterboarding or something that could very well be considered cruel and humane and degrading punishment or treatment. Right. You know, you're probably, given that there's now a sort of even more explicit law on the books, and it is more explicit, you're probably going to think twice about it. I mean, before, you know, you might, there might be this argument that you had cover from the Justice Department and whatever. It's not, right. that, it's not that McCain really sort of cleared it all up, but it, it probably, I think it could give them another, uh, you know, another moment of doubt before they would do such a thing. Um, but I, I think the other issue is that the sort of weird potential unintended consequences of it, right? Which, which are? Which are, to the degree that you say, look, you guys can't, you know, you, you, you guys can't engage in this stuff um, if you're U.S. personnel, right? And if it, this person is in U.S. custody. And, right. And uh, so, um, at, oh, and by the way, there's this other less noticed provision that also went through, right, that said... Um, not as McCain, but as part of another amendment to the uh, defense bill that said, oh, and by the way, um, uh, testimony gained through coercion is A-OK, -okay, right? It, it, right, Emily Bazelon wrote about that for Slate. Right, Emily Bazelon wrote about that for Slate. The, and, uh, but, but let's put that sort of aside. No, 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 because I, I actually think that they're connected. Because okay. if you take those things together, right, if you say, well, testimony gained through um, coercion could be okay, and by the way, you can't engage in coercion, then what are you likely to do? Well, ship them abroad. You're likely to ship them abroad. And by the way, McCain doesn't say squat about rendition, about uh, shipping people abroad. It used to. It used to in its original language, but that rendition language was taken out. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, of course, the same situation sort of applies in standard Fourth Amendment law, or uh, I think it's the police can't search your house, but if some private citizen goes searches your house, the police can use the evidence at trial under some circumstances. You know more about that than me. But, but torture is a much more severe act with graver consequences to our position in the world. Right. So I, I just think that it, it, it clearly increases the incentives, the sort of structural incentives for, you know, shipping some dude off to Egypt or Syria or wherever. That's um, very interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, I want to move on to uh, another topic, so I'm going to ring the bell. Ring it. The Barrett Report, uh, there's uh, the special prosecutor who investigated Henry Cisneros way back in the Clinton administration is still in business, and he's still in business because he claims to have uncovered uh, nefarious, politicized wrongdoing in the IRS. Uh, he's written a report, it's been sitting around, uh, Democrats in Congress have been trying to prevent him from releasing it. It seems an open and shut case that if we've 
you know, this guy did go off the off the rails. He he maybe wasn't a good special prosecutor. He spent millions and millions of dollars of the taxpayers' money. We should at least see the report, see what he came up with. Yeah. Uh, it may be a complete nothing burger, uh, but there was enough smoke in the Clinton administration with all the the bimbos that were involved with Clinton somehow getting audited by the IRS that uh, I would want to know, was there some funny business going on? Well, I, I, I read the winger material that you sent me on it, uh, you know, which was somewhat convicting. But it was a Bob Novak column. Is he winger material? Uh, uh, I'll, I leave that to our, I'll leave that to our viewers. Okay. Um, but he, what I don't get is why, why would Republicans, and there were some Republicans who, who agreed to this, right, who agreed to kind of putting it under the carpet or whatever. Why? Well, they, they agreed. They agreed. The, the Democratic strategy has been to allow people to petition to get parts of it redacted, and the Republicans say, okay, you can redact it if we publish the whole thing. And the worry is that it's going to, you know, be a, be a, you know, one of those things where everything is blacked out, uh, that there won't be much to it. So why and, would Republicans uh, agree to that? The, well, because they, you know, they get along to go along. And maybe they, maybe, maybe there's some dirt, maybe there's some Republican manipulation of the IRS, too, that they, they don't want out, so that there's a mutual cover-up. Cover up. The, the source for Novak's column was Charles Grassley. He's a Republican, right. and he's, he's not happy with it. So uh, he, he wants the information out. And, you know, it, I, I very much, you know, Mike McCurry, Clinton's press secretary, said, look, the reason this didn't happen is because we're not insane. They know that this was the, the most toxic thing in Watergate was the, the appearance that the IRS had been used to persecute enemies. Right. Uh, and, and so the, the Clinton would be insane to use the IRS to persecute his enemies. That, but that doesn't mean that some regional director didn't, like, you know, go off on an expedition of his own to overzealously audit Clinton's enemies. Uh, and I want to know that, too. Fair enough. Um, so, uh, but I think that's why, there were, you know, there are all sorts of uh, you scratch my back, I scratch your back deals in Washington that result in the truth not getting out. Uh it's only the power of uh, outsider institutions like blogging heads that keeps them on us. That's right. Power to the people. Um, okay. Uh, I, have, I have one more thing I want to mention, which is uh, uh, I, I, we talked a lot about Brokeback Mountain. I talked perhaps too much about Brokeback Mountain. Right. But I predicted that Frank Rich would uh, guilt trip America when Brokeback Mountain didn't do well. But he had a call-up today. He, he, he's still in the preliminary stages uh, and it's a good test. He says uh, he says it's going to succeed. Uh, he writes. Um, he talks about the Los Angeles Times asking, "Can Brokeback Mountain move that heartland?" And he says, "This will be answered with a resounding yes. All the signs of a runaway phenomenon are present, from an instant parody on Saturday Night Live to reports that a multiplex in Plano, Texas, was sold out. My God, uh, so, uh, I think this is a test of how." much in the cocoon Frank Rich is. Uh, I claim that uh, it will not be a resounding success. So we'll see in a few weeks uh, who's right and who's wrong. Is America swept with brokeback mountain fever? Do they flock to the theaters to see uh, this moving story of a love denied, or, or is it a relative commercial flop? I'm, I'm waiting with bated breath to see who's right uh, in this debate. So am I. Yeah. Okay. All right. This has been real. It's been great. Okay, let's... Uh, uh, let's end it. All right, talk to oh. you soon. See you, Eric.